Okay, welcome back to part five. Uh, the, the previous section, my computer did in fact get overloaded and the sound cut out for the last two minutes of the video. Uh, that is um, because it was busy doing processing and it had trouble recording at the same time. So in the meantime, I've kind of let that run on its own and I'm just going to summarize the results here. Um, we ran the model and we have this fit uh, with a very low R squared. It reports a little bit differently. It's got a root mean squared error in R squared um, and MAE is not an indicator that I have worked with. Um, but these figures are not absolute values. They are used to compare models to each other. Um, so it's um, to some extent you know, we, we want to be careful and, and not switch to another model until we have something that improves the result. On the other hand, when we look at the final model, we can see there are 500 trees, but we only explained 0.21% percent of the variation. So that's not good uh, any way you slice it. Uh, this particular approach of trying to explain the vehicle year uh, has sort of revealed that there's no connection between the vehicle year and any of the characteristics of the parking tickets that are, are generated. So it's not like vehicles um, have a, a particular type of parking ticket or something that, that happens to them based on the age of the vehicle, um, which again might be very sensible, but we can't really use this model to predict anything uh, at this point. Now in that example I use the um, the unscaled data. So I repeated that um, analysis with the scaled data on line 556 and I let this run. So I'm looking at RF fit 2 now. RF fit 2 uh, has a much lower mean squared error because again we've standardized, we've reduced most of those numbers. That's That's not a number that is uh, again, directly comparable to the one we did before. We'd have to look at other scaled models with the same number of variables for the RMSE to be comparable. Our R squared has improved maybe just a tiny bit. And we now explain instead of 0.12% of the variation, we explain 0.18% of the variation. Uh, so an improvement, but a very tiny one. Um, so anyway, this is more to illustrate to you how to run the algorithm in Carrot. Um, I'm going to run it again with uh, a linear regression model. So this, um, this data is a bit different. Um, we don't have to worry so much about scaling the data when we're running a linear regression. So I'm just going to use the non-character sample that we've had from before. Uh, the setup or the syntax of this is slightly different. Um, we are labeling things a bit differently, but it's really the same train control, train functions. So we, we're going to just iterate five times. We're going to cross-validate five times. Um, we're going to specify what our model is. So is the vehicle year related to the issuer precinct? Um, is the model we're trying to fit? I'm not trying to get too fancy with that. Um, and then applying the train control result. Tr train control equals data control, which we've set up up here. And the method LM. So that is a bit more succinct process. It's going to uh, th still think for a little bit because we're running against 400,000 observations, uh, but you notice it finishes a bit sooner. And here's our model. Again, this 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 very uh, sad looking R squared. Um, it returns uh, again the same kind of observation metrics and we can look at what the final model is in the same way by referring to that. So here's our intercept and coefficient on issuer precinct. So we, we do find some relationship. Um, it's one of those R regression uh, objects. 
So I can insert it in a summary command to get more detail out. And it's significant, but it, once again, the R square is, is um, really miserably small. <laughs> uh, so uh, not a lot of explanatory power uh, in what we've done so far. So I've given you a link here with more about using caret and um, the subsequent section uh, repeats the same idea um, of setting up training and testing data uh, in a, a little bit more um, explicit format. So let's run through this again. I think the repetition is helpful um, to get used to the way these are formulated. So we're, we're using the same functions, create data partition, and we're going to use the train function in just a moment. So I'm going to train the row number, create an object called train row numbers by creating a data partition. This is uh, based on feet from the curb. And I'm only taking 0.05% uh, of, of the data, just because, again, I want something quick and responsive for this, this demo purpose. Um, create our training and test split splits based on those train row numbers. Uh, in this case, I'm going to specify my X and Y variables a little more explicitly. So the Y is the response variable, feet from curb. The X is the other elements of the data set uh, specified by the column number that I want to use as explanatory variables. And to show you that you know there are actually a number of different methods that can be used in Caret, um, I'm going to retrieve the model names with this get, get model info function, and there's so many of them that I'm just going to squeeze them together with the paste function, so we can see them. Uh, this these are all of the models that you can choose from. So Caret implements a huge range of um, machine learning methods. Um, and so you can apply this training and testing split. You can you can run your models under the umbrella of Caret uh, for all of these different methods, and you can go into the documentation and you know read more about each one of these. Obviously, there's almost too many there for any one person to to master. Uh, but we're gonna at this point look at the k nearest neighbors model. So this is actually um, a similar kind of concept to the k means that we saw, uh, but the k nearest neighbors um, is is something that we use um, as an algorithm, right? So the the cluster k means clustering creates clusters, but k nearest neighbors um, puts objects into classes based on this this algorithm. Now we can again use this uh, to generate predictions just by passing it through the the caret process. So that's what we're going to see here. All right, so I'm going to specify the method k and n. So I'm, here I'm just training x comma y. There's no cross-validation here. I'm not specifying that. Um, but I'm training the model in k nearest neighbors. k nearest neighbors is a little bit computationally intensive also. So that's one reason that I want to keep my uh, number of my proportion of data points small. Um, this is something that would be very difficult to run against the full data set of 42 million um, without some real scoping out of how much, how many resources you need. Um, so I'm going to generate the model. Then I'm going to use the predict function to generate the predicted values. And finally plot the model. So 
This is being trained again against the test, the training data set, right? We specified X as train data and Y as train data. Uh, but once we have those predictions, we will compare it to the test data uh, coming up in line 612. And I'm hoping, there we go. So our model has completed its run. Um, as it says, a large train of 20 elements, 6.5 megabytes. And so let's generate the, the fitted values. Take a look at the model. Um, so here's the root mean squared error. Um, it's one nice thing about this is that it does the checking for the optimal value of k. So k equals 9 was the optimal value that it, it determined. R square is, is much, much better than we've seen before that there probably is some explanatory ability here. And here's a plot of the how the root mean squared error changes as you increase the number of neighbors. Okay, so now let's look at those predicted um, values. Uh, when we apply this model to the test data, what are the predictions? And the test data is actually much larger. Remember, we trained the data on 5% of the complete data set. So the test data is 400,000 observations. That's why this step takes a bit longer. And when it's long like that, it always makes me wonder if it's time to stop the video or not, but I'm going to hang in there for another moment. There we go. So that, that wasn't too bad. It's much more computationally intensive to fit the model because there's a lot of unknown possibilities um, versus computing based on the existing model. And what do these predictions look like? Um, they're actually, if you remember the feet from the curb, we had normalized it. And so a negative 0.14 like this is actually equivalent to zero feet from the curb. Much of the data was zero feet from the curb, so the first observations all look like they're pretty much in that category. Um, if we look at this uh, root mean square error, we can actually compute it directly via this RMSE function from ML Tools and use that as a, as a kind of guide to how we did. So you notice that in the uh, training data, we had a root mean square error of 0.82, whereas we've done a little bit better even with the testing data. So the model didn't deteriorate uh, when we applied it to the testing data. And that's another good sign, right, that, that, that things are okay. This might be a useful model to take, to a useful approach to take. Uh, and I'm going to do one final thing here, which is um, to look at categorical data. And so I'm going to split my data into the data that is near the curb, meaning basically the zero, uh, zero feet from the curb, and then everything else, right, to see if I can just predict something about whether the vehicle would, would be parked away from the curb or not. Uh, I do that by using this less than uh, negative 0.14, which is pretty much equivalent to the zero in the data set. And then I apply labels to it of false or true. Um, and if I take a look at that variable now, which is just feet. I can see that it's true. Right? So the trues are the ones that are zero feet from the curb. Uh, now we're just going to run this very same algorithms against the data, except we're using um, a slightly smaller uh, X data set. I don't think we need to see the model names again. 
but I'm going to fit it once again with K nearest neighbors. And the thing is that when we are we're fitting this, uh, it's very similar to the previous um, model because you know the measurements are the same, the underlying measurements are the same. We've just split it into two very simplified groups of zero and everything non-zero. Um, so we have a little bit of a problem fitting the model. There's some warnings here. Um, but the reason that there are warnings is because it, some of these things don't apply in the same way to a uh, categorical factor. So when we look at the model, we actually still get results um, that are very similar to what we saw before. We still get this, um, this plot. And we can generate our predictions. Which again is a slightly computational intensive step. And what I'm going to do, because the model is really using the same numeric approach as before, I'm going to convert those predicted value values into factors in the same way that we did for the training data um, so that we can then test it. So the, the, the prediction uh, gives us a numerical result, but we, we convert it back into a factor so that we have this true-false variables. So now, finally, what I can do is I can look at the confusion matrix uh, on line 669. And this is really what I wanted to show you, was that you can get a confusion matrix uh, for these caret-generated model objects that look something like this. So here, um, the, there were 382,000 approximately parking tickets that were, had, were zero feet from the curb, and we also predicted them to be zero feet from the curb. There were 9,867 um, false negatives. We predicted they wouldn't be near the curb, but they were. There are 194 false positives that were, we predicted would be at the curb, but weren't. And there were 10,000 10, observations that were parked away from the curb, and we predicted that also. Right? So the, um, this cell is really you know, the dominant one, and we've gotten most of those right. So the accuracy is 0.975. But the kappa is only 0.6. 656. Six. Still, you know, this is um, this is a reasonable, uh, it, you know, that's a decent level of prediction unless uh, there are particular false positives or um, false negatives that you you're very concerned about, um, where it's important not to make a mistake in certain categories. Okay, so we can also do um, what's called a feature plot if we want to see a little bit of this data. However, um, the plot is, I think, not super informative um, because we've got this factor variable um, that's either on or off. So we can see that across our other dimensions of data. Um, and in this case, we're looking at uh, variable number four. What are the names of rescale parking? This is issuer code versus the, the distance from the curb. Uh, is there a relationship? Well, for certain values, there are no entries near the curb, but otherwise it's hard to make a, a strong pattern out of these categorical variables. So I'm not going to show more of the feature plot uh, issues. 
So I'm going to stop here for this section. And we've seen that you know this is a little bit of a difficult data set to analyze. It's 42 million observations of somewhat messy real world data with, with some limitations as to what it actually says. You know, it's only about the parking tickets, so there's not a lot of interesting stories we can tell. Um, and we're not trying to do geographic analysis or time analysis here. Uh, so that limits, again, the approach we took. Uh, but what I'd like you to take away from it is just this general method that's available to you, especially the carrot package, which can manage your cross-validation, your training and testing split, and the model that you use, um, and put it all into a nice wrapper uh, that you can then uh, pull your results from and see how your your model has actually performs in a predictive sense. So I'm going to stop here. The final segment will be on neural networks and it'll be a little bit different content uh, to what we've seen right now. So thanks for